I think it's pretty relevant that we sung at the start, How Great Is Our God? Because I think something that I've been pondering about this week it was that, How Great Is Our God? And I want you guys, I encourage you guys all to read Isaiah, because Isaiah really, in fact, all the Old Testament prophets, because it sets about this image of God, which we usually are not confronted with. We, we usually in our Western civilization, in our society, even the way I grew up, was about this guy who lives in clouds with a white robe, with a white um, beard, and he chills out and has a good time. That's our perception of a God, a God who doesn't really care, a God who's really not that powerful because he doesn't seem to be in control of everything. But if you put aside what you know and what I know and you read the word of God, your picture of God becomes something entirely different. And this is what I want to start off with. And I encourage you guys all, because obviously I can't sit here and read to you the whole 66 chapter books, chapters of Isaiah. But if you read it, you have a totally different picture of God of what you might presume God is. So Isaiah chapter 40 from verse 21. And I'll read it until verse 26. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants, therefore, are as grasshoppers. They stretch out the heavens as a curtain, and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. That brings the princes to nothing. He judges, he makes the judges of the earth as van- vanity. He Yea, they shall not be planted, yes, they shall not be sown, yes, the stocks shall not take root in the earth, and shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind should take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things, that brings out the host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might. For he is strong in power, not one fails. Do you guys follow me in what this passage was talking about God? I'll quickly just go through, go through it. In verse 22, it talks about that God sits upon the earth. That the earth, in a, the earth is nothing but his seat. In another reference, we know that the earth is his footstool. It's the imagery of how big God is and how totally in control and authority he has over the earth. It continues to say that all, all the inhabitants of the earth, you and me, compared to him, are nothing but grasshoppers. Nothing but grasshoppers. I think that's an incredible um, comparison. Because I've never heard that before. I've never in my life talked heard anyone say, you're like a grasshopper to me. But that's what the Bible says in comparison. God and the inhabitants of the earth are like grasshoppers to him. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and he spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Do you guys know what the heavens is talking about? Space here. He's talking about by his hands, he has spread out the heavens. Um, if you guys know anything about how big space is, then you begin to understand the size of God. We begin to understand what he is saying here, that he stretches it out. He is the one that pulls out the heavens. In verse 23, it says that he brings the princes of this world to nothing. The greatest kings, the greatest authorities, the greatest people you can think of in your mind, whoever it is, these people are like nothing to him. He makes the judges... It says, I don't know if this is your version, but judges of the earth as vanity, saying as if they're nothing. And in verse 24, it talks about they will not have a solid footing, but in verse 25, it says, to whom will you liken me with? Or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. And I just want you guys to put this in your mind. This is God speaking, saying, who shall you liken me with? After giving, and the whole Isaiah is covered with comparisons of who God is. If you read, Isaiah is such a beautiful book because it has so many different imageries for God. In fact, the majority of the ones that you probably speak are probably found in Isaiah. But he says it numerous times after comparing himself to his things, who shall you liken me with? I am equal to none. 
And as I was reading this, a thought came to my mind. If God is so big, if God is so mighty, so powerful, that nothing can be likened to him, how can I reach him? How can I reach a God that is so far away? How can I comprehend this God? How can I even have the thought of being in communion with this God, in fellowship, in a relationship with this God? And I think this is a serious matter because I think we talk too easily or we, we play it off the tongue that we're in a relationship with God, but we forget who this God is. We forget he, how powerful he is, how glorified he is. And I want you guys to put, keep that in your mind now. Just keep this picture of God in your mind while we look at some different things in Scripture. All right? You guys got that in your mind? Yes? Yes? Okay, good. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And if you guys want to give, you know, a title for Facebook or whatever, you can call it The Man of Sorrows. The Man of Sorrows. That title is found in Isaiah 53. I'm not going to read it, but it's in Isaiah 53. It says that, he was a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. This is talking about the Jesus Christ. You can guys look at it. I actually encourage you to all read Isaiah 53 because it's pretty much the fifth gospel of the Bible. Pretty much. And I encourage you guys all to read it, but I'm not going to read it. But the title and what we're going to look at is the man of sorrows. Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows. So verse, chapter 14, verse 32 and I was afraid, just follow on with me. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. Guess, how do you say it? Gethsemane? 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 And he said to his disciples, Sit you here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Yeah. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be sore amazed and be to be very heavy. And he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So you guys understand, I'm pretty sure most of you guys will know this story, but let's just look at some of the background. He had just had Passover with his disciples. And at the Passover, he said, one of you are going to betray me, and another one of you are going to deny me three times in front of people. And right before these verses, we have Peter reaffirming that he will never ever deny Jesus. He says, in fact, I will die for you. And this is verse 31. If I should die with you, I will not deny you in any wise. So he's saying to you, right before this, this scenario, Peter, his disciples, saying, even if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. And, but Jesus had told him he would deny him three times. Just so you understand what is going, what's going on here. So Jesus and disciples go into the Garden of Gethsemane, I hope I'm saying that right. And he is about to be betrayed. And Jesus, being God, knows what's going to happen. He knows what is foretold. He knows what must be fulfilled. And at that time, at this moment, it says that he was so amazed and to be very heavy. And he himself said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. So he was so sorrowful to the point of death. He was on that point where he had, if he had more sorrow, he felt like he was going to die. This is Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, saying, I am at the point of death right now. This is before he got betrayed, before he even started the sufferings which the Romans put upon him. Before any of that, he said, He's about to pray, and he was sorrowful unto death. Now, what I want you guys to get from this is to understand why Jesus was sorrowful. I don't believe that he was sorrowful because he saw he was going to get crucified. 
Because while crucifixion is very painful, I'm not trying to put that down at all, but I do not think that was his issue right here. I do not think the physical pain of being on the cross was his issue here. I think here the gravity of sin was being emphasised. The gravity of what he was about to do was being emphasised not in the physical sense, but rather the spiritual sense. And we know this because in verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. What cup is this? Does anyone know what the cup is? Is it funny? No? Good. What is this cup that Jesus is talking about? Does anyone know what the cup is? Anyone? He, said, he says in his prayer, take away this cup from me if it is possible. What cup is it talking about? The cup of wrath. That's exactly right. Not only does Jesus tell us that upon the cross, the power of darkness is going to be at its strongest and he'll be fighting Satan, the power of darkness. Not only will he be bearing my iniquities and your iniquities, but the wrath of God we fully place upon him upon that cross. When he was on that cross, the full wrath of God was upon Jesus. And Jesus, knowing that this was coming, knowing that that cup of wrath was coming, cried out in agony because he foresaw that cup which was coming. But I think it's incredible that Jesus took, kept on going because of his love for us. The only reason that that cup was not passed away from him was because his love for us was so great that he saw the pain of the full wrath of God, which was for us, and he still took it. He still drank it fully and complete, that wrath of God. And I think as Christians, and even if you're not a Christian, you have to begin to understand the gravity of sin. you got Jesus Christ here, the Word of God incarnated in flesh, the very image of God crying out in agony, and in suffering, in, in sorrowfulness, that's the word, from the cup which is about to be put upon him. And for me right here is an emphasis of his love. And I also like to think about that who was giving him this cup of wrath? Who was giving it to him? It was, he says in the psalm, Abba, Father, Abba, my dear Father, my beloved Father. It's a, a word you use for someone, not just your dad that, you know, you've been had, you know, long ties with that didn't work out, but your close, loving Father, my Father who I love and who loves me and, my only, and I am your only begotten, beloved Son. Take this away from me. Don't pour your wrath upon me. But not your will, not my will, but your will be done. And I, I want you guys to register this in your mind. The gravity of sin and how much he pushed Christ. Where he pushed Jesus in his emotional state and his physical state. It doesn't say in this gospel, in another gospel, it says that his sweat was turning into blood. And this is actually a medical condition, medical condition that when someone receives so much anxiety or stress that their sweat actually begins um, to mingle with blood. Just so we can begin to understand what Jesus is going through. Now, one thing that's always encouraged me about this passage, that always lifts me up, is that even though while Jesus was praying to God, he was praying to God here for help. He was praying for strength and encouragement. While he was in his deepest agonies, his concern was still for his disciples. His concern and his love was still facing his disciples, even though he was at a point where he was so sorrowful unto death. We read this. We know this story. After he prayed, in verse 37, and he comes and finds them sleeping, said unto Peter, Simon, how do you sleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit is truly... The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Right here, after Jesus, and we know that Jesus went back praying another two times. He went back to Peter and told him, Peter, do not enter into temptation. He wanted Peter to be strong. 
Jesus could have ignored his disciples, could have left them away. But in his deepest agonies, his concern and his love were still towards his disciples. And I think this is a, a type or a foretelling of his love for us. That his agony was for us. His suffering was for us. His sorrowfulness was for us. And we just begin to see how selfless Jesus was. How selfless that in his sorrow, he was looking after his disciples. In his sorrow, his love was towards his disciples. And we know this that in John, he talks about when um, the sheep will, scat- will be scattered. But even when they're scattered, he will not lose one of the sheep which God has given him. And that's his promise. Even while he was being crucified, not one did he lose. Not one of his disciples were lost. And I think we begin to, to understand and we begin to see the love of Christ in this. The love of Christ is emphasized in his sorrow, in his misery, and in the pain which he was going through. And now, I want you guys to connect it with me with what we read in Isaiah. We read about this God who is almighty and all-powerful and full of wisdom. And he says, who shall you liken me with? So where's the connection here? Where's the connection between that God and Jesus here? Where is the connection with me as well? Where is the connection with God saying, who shall you liken me with? With me and Jesus here, the Son of God, weeping in agony, and with me, a grasshopper, in comparison, nothing to God. What is, where is the connection? What is it? And this is what I want you guys to focus on. And this is why it's so important for us to understand why Jesus was a sorrowful man why he had to go through sorrow, why he had to go through pain, and why he had to go through suffering. We have to begin to understand this, that this was the only way God could reform this connection with me, me and him, and you and him, and any man and him, was only through the sufferings and the sorrows of Jesus Christ. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, we'll see, we'll see this here in Hebrews. Throughout all of Hebrews, we have what we're talking about completely repeated. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. And before we read it, you must understand that why Jesus had to become a man, come to earth and die, was because he must be our captain. He must be our leader. He must be the person who we rally behind for us to enter into the presence of God. Only through rallying behind our captain, Jesus Christ, can we enter into God's presence. This God who is far, it's not like God isn't far. Isaiah makes it clear God is far. He is so much more exceedingly higher than us. He is far. Hi, Robbie. And he is unreachable. The Bible makes it clear we are unreachable to God. God cannot stand the presence of sin. In his holiness, sin is completely what he is not. We are unreachable and he is far from us. So the only way that God could reconnect us with him was through a man, Jesus Christ. And that man had to go through these sorrows, had to go through these sufferings that we might follow him as our captain. This is said earlier in Hebrews. I think Hebrews chapter 2 talks about Jesus being our captain. Only by his leading can we enter into God's presence. And Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verse 14 says, Seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like as we were, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The only way that a man can enter into the throne of grace, into the presence of God, is by our great high priest, by following him, by following his footsteps, by following his lead as the second man into the, into the heavens. 
as he is our great high priest. And this is a great high priest who can be touched. A great high priest who is not far away. A great high priest who is not unreachable because he became a man and experienced to the fullest way everything that a man can experience. He experienced our problems, our infirmities, our sorrows and sufferings in the most fullest way. And that is why we can reach the unreachable God is because we have a reachable high priest. And I really hope you guys begin to understand what this means and the, who Christ is to me. Christ is more than just a moral teacher. Christ is more than a man who got Jews angry at him. He is my high priest in the presence of God right now and the only way I have had access to God who is in heaven. And what's um, the writers of Hebrews' conclusion? Because of this, let us hold fast to our profession. Let's hold fast to what we proclaim because we have a high priest. My friends, the man of sorrows who we read about, the man of sorrows and sufferings who was in so much agony onto the point of death, this is our high priest. This is who we relate to. We do not relate to a man who came in glory. We do not relate to a man who came with a kingdom behind him, but rather we relate to a man who had to suffer and had to have sorrows. And this is why we can reach the unreachable God through Jesus Christ. So why am I saying this? Why am I telling you guys this? I'm sure many of you guys, even though you, you might not be able to work it out already, have some sort of knowledge of this, some sort of understanding that the only way through God was through Jesus. The only way was because Jesus became a man and made the way for all mankind. But why I'm saying this is when we're presented with this fact, when we're presented that the unreachable God is reachable through Jesus Christ, we, we only have two options. And this is firstly our face value. You have two options. You can first, you can despise this man. You can mock this man like nearly every single person did at that crucifixion. You can despise him, you can mock him. A man who was... We read Isaiah 53, he talks about that was what he was associated with, that people would despise him. No one was attracted to him. You can despise him or you can adore him. That, the two, that is the two options Jesus presents to all mankind. And I pray and I hope that everyone he has chosen to adore this man, adore this saviour, adore this king and our high priest. Now, if you have chosen this way and you have chosen to adore this king, the, the, the things that God has done for us should in every way change my life. You cannot experience a love so great, a love so powerful, a love so mighty and not be affected by it. You cannot experience it and not be changed. It requires a change in your man. This love which is from God has to have an effect in your life. And this is the test. This is how we know that if we really do know God, if you really have reached God, it's, you know it by your, the love. And we read this, if you turn with me, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. I finished off now. I don't, didn't really have much to say today, but this is just on my heart. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, from verse 7. My friends, if you have followed this man of sorrows, and you adore this man of sorrows, and this man has made the path for you to reach the unreachable God, and to reach the far God, then this is what happens. This is the effects of that reconciliation reconciliation with God. This is the effects of it. Beloved, chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, not knows not God, for God is love. In this was manifested love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that, God, not that we love God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. The love which we have can only be from God because God loved us first. And this is a test of a Christian. This is the mold of a Christian. Everything that a Christian is should be centered around the love which God has given us and the love which we love him with because he loved us first. And I don't want to go into verse 10 too much, but this idea that we love him, why? Because his son, our saviour, our captain, became what we should have became. He became sin itself upon that cross. Not only did he bear it, but sin himself. It literally was that Jesus became sin upon that cross. That is the love which is undeniable. That is the love which is so great. And only through Jesus. And when I was reading this, I was getting convicted myself. Because oftentimes, we know as Christians we must love. You know, read any part of the Bible. The Bible makes it pretty clear the behavior which must become of a Christian. A Christian must love. A Christian must show characteristics of love. But oftentimes, I try to do love out of my flesh. I try to do love, which what I understand of love. I try to do love out of my conditional love. I try to do love out of, you know, well, I think I should be doing this. I'm going to do it. But no, the Bible says the love is the love which is from God. You have this love because God loved you. You know, and I, as a Christian today, I pray to God, God, increase my love. Increase your love in my life. And when God's love is so strong in your life, when God's love is so powerful in your life, it can't but flow out to everyone around you. When God's love is strong in you, it will flow out on its own to others. I do not need to force this love. This love will take control of me. And I am not standing here as a person who's perfected this because I am nowhere even close. But as Christians, we must continually rebuke and examine ourselves and see where we stand according to that love. 